Hi, and welcome to The Working Songwriter, the show where today's best songwriters come to talk shop. I'm your host, Joe Pug. Each episode here, we host a distinguished guest, and we ask them to go deep on their inspiration, on their process, on the general ups and downs of making a life in music. So, whether you're a grizzled veteran using ChatGPT to compose lyrics for your new power ballad, or else a scrappy upstart, using ChatGPT to compose the most effective cold email pitch to your favorite indie record label, this is your show. Because ultimately, it is what every writer seeks most, an ironclad excuse to put off actually writing. Hey everybody, it's St. Patrick's Day 2023, and I thank you for joining us. This week's show is brought to you by Bandzoogle. Built by musicians and for musicians, Bandzoogle is an all-in-one platform to build a beautiful website for your music. I'm old enough to remember when you had to pay somebody called a web developer to get a website made. And it would always be some guy named Marco who drove a GMC Safari with purple racing stripes and a DJ Shadow bumper sticker and who was always trying to sell you 200 milligram caffeine pills that he claimed were Adderall. And old Marco would charge you about a thousand bucks for a website that would be obsolete in six months. But it's the future. Now, you guys, that's not how it works anymore. We're allowed to have nice things now. One of those nice things is Banzoogle. Banzoogle powers the websites of tens of thousands of musicians around the world, from weekend warriors to Grammy winners. All the features you need for a professional website are already built in. Hosting and a custom domain name, dozens of fully customizable design templates. This year, Banzoogle would like to congratulate its members on surpassing $100 million in commission-free sales through their websites. The Working Songwriter Podcast listeners can go to Banzoogle.com to try it for free for 30 days. Use the promo code TWS to get 15% off the first year of any subscription. If you'd like to hear some of my music live in the coming weeks, you can check out my tour page, joepugmusic.com slash tour, where there are a bevy of new tour dates posted all around the world, from Seattle to Annapolis, Maryland. Finally, if you enjoy this podcast, if you'd like to help it remain a viable endeavor for me, here's a couple things that you could do to help. First, you could become a supporter of the show over at Patreon. Patreon is a platform that allows you to directly support creative endeavors that you find meaningful. You just head to their site, P-A-T-R-E-O-N, you search for The Working Songwriter, or you search for my name, and then you sign up to kick in a few bucks every month for the show. Think of it as a voluntary subscription, a subscription that you certainly don't have to pay for, but that you choose to pay for because you dig the show and because you won't miss a few bucks at the end of the month. If just 1% of our listenership would kick in the price of a cup of coffee, it would make an immense difference. So thank you to everybody who's taken the time and the capital to support the show in that way. If, if you can't contribute to the show in, in that manner, that's totally fine. There's still a couple ways that you can help out the show for free. First, you could leave us a rating in the iTunes store. Or second, you could simply tell a friend about the show. Spread the word about the show. The simple math on those two things is that they will help me much more than they will be a pain in the ass for you. Okay, I'll end all the harassment there. I got to catch up with Steve a couple months ago on the phone, and it was a blast. I hope you enjoy our conversation. Our guest this week hails from Pennsylvania and now makes his home in Nashville, Tennessee. Steve Mokler left his hometown of Bethel Park to attend university at Nashville's Belmont before dropping out to focus on music full time. He got his big songwriting break when Dirks Bentley not only cut his song Riser, but also used the track as the inspiration and title of his 2015 album of the same name. Mokler songs have also been recorded by Reba McIntyre, Ashley Monroe, Jake Owen, Ben Rector, and many others. All the while, he's maintained a robust career as an artist in his own right. He's toured with Old Dominion, Willie Nelson, and Tim McGraw and Faith Hill. Rolling Stone has praised him as thoughtful singer-songwriter fair in the blue-collar vein. 
I got a chance to catch up with Steve on the phone a few months ago and hear about his musical journey so far. Steve Mochler, thanks so much for being a part of the Working Songwriter podcast. You're a country musician who was born and raised um, outside of Pittsburgh. Now, people who don't tour the country for a living wouldn't know that um, that Pittsburgh, you know, Western Pennsylvania and Eastern Ohio actually has a lot more in common with the American South than you might think. Uh, I'm interested to know what kind of what kind of music um, was in your milieu growing up. What what kind of stuff yeah. were you swimming in? So, you know, my first, you know, exposure to music was really my dad's music, which my dad worked from home. He, you know, he's an architect and worked in our basement and had a, was always listening to music. And, and that kind of stuff was uh, Bruce Springsteen, the Eagles, Bob Seger. Um, I mean, that, that kind of rootsy, Elton John, Billy Joel, kind of storyteller, the singer songwriter stuff of the 70s, so James Taylor. Um, so there really, there really wasn't a lot of country in the stew. Um, and even, even my own music, uh, when I kind of became a teenager, I got into stuff like John Mayer and Coldplay and the Counting Crows. And, um, so there wasn't a ton of country until, until my grandma started driving me to church uh, when I was a, a junior in high school, um, started going to church with her. She lived with us and she always listened to country countdown on, on, on the drives. And I was reluctant about it for a while. Uh, I want to listen to rock or pop station, but eventually, you know, I, I connected with the storytelling of, of country music because uh, that's really what it is. And when I look back at the other stuff, my early exposure, that was really kind of a, a major thread of going through all that. So I didn't get that was that was a little bit of where I was coming from. Obviously, it got really ramped up when I got to Nashville, but that's a little bit of. Yeah, you know, my early exposure to music. Was she um, was she listening to like classic country stuff, or was she listening to what was modern at the time? She was well, she, on those drives. We listened to what was modern at the time, you know, uh, and then that that was, I guess, that was in the early two thousands. Mm -hmm. um, but she did listen to her and my grandfather. They listened to like um, you know Waylon Jennings, and you know, they they had a, a, a bar in their basement, and it was a rowdy, fun place where neighbors would get together in a blue collar town, and they'd listen to um, you know the the outlaw stuff. You know that was kind of the, the, a lot of their roots in country music. I, I'm just trying to contemplate for a moment how south my life would go if I had a bar in my basement. I would. <laughs> I, I would. Right. Uh, I wouldn't be able to handle that, but some people are, and God bless them for it. Um, that, that, that's awesome. So that, you know, you mentioned at first being kind of um, uh, circumspect about it, it, listening to that station. Uh, can you remember an artist or a song um, that came on where you thought to yourself, well, actually, this is something I could be into? Who kind of changed your oh, mind? Man. Yeah. I mean, I would be lying to you if I, if I tried to pull one. I guess from those Sunday drives, but around the same time was a song um, called a Kenny Chesney song. Um, there goes my life, mm -hmm. was, which I guess was around, what was around that era. I can't remember if I heard that one on the, in her Ford Taurus on the way to church or up in my girlfriend's boombox after school. But I remember hearing that song in particular and thinking, I mean, I, 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 I felt so much emotion. I could see the whole song and I felt like I lived that guy's story mm. just as a sophomore in high school. And I think that was the moment I, I really could realize kind of how, I don't know, how, how big, how big of a story you could tell with a song. Um, and I, you know, I, the stuff that I had kind of listened to, I feel like before that wasn't as far reaching. It wasn't as, when you really kind of craft a story like that, um, that, that's one that really made a mark on me in that era. Yeah. So what you're referring to there is what I think is the through line of American country music. There's a lot of people that bitch and moan about like, you know, country music, not sounding like it, it used to, and, and fair enough, but things change, but why is yeah. it still country music? Why is it, you know, what is the through line? I think the through line is that it's telling stories in the way that you're describing right there. It's not impressionistic. It's kind of realistic. Um, it tends to take, you know, there'll be a story in like three acts often. Um, right. And you can, draw, you can draw a straight line between Tom T. Hall, you know, 40 years ago 
and and more modern stuff now. And I, I think that's the tie that binds. So it's interesting Agreed. that that's what what brought you to the form. Yeah, and you know, and that story again, that's not a you know, this song for those who don't know, it's a song about a uh, you know a guy that gets his girlfriend pregnant in high school and is so upset about it. Then by the end of the song, he sends her off to college. He's there, you know, there goes my life. And so there's nothing inherently Southern or, or agricultural or, you know, party tailgate, all these things that people kind of want to pigeonhole country music as. It's just a, a real life story. And I think that's the, that's the kind of stuff that has, has kept me coming back and the kind of stuff I, I try to create. And it's a real life point. story, but, but there is also like there is also like an ethic and a culture to it because you're not mm -hmm. telling the story of the guy who, um, you know, knocked up the girl in high school and then went on with his life and did whatever the hell he wanted. Like, it's often telling the story right. of the guy yeah. who knocked up the girlfriend in high school, but then did the damn right thing, you know? That's right. Yeah, you're right. No, it, it, for sure. Yeah, and, and, and being so close to it, it's hard to even see that. But, you know, you're, you're right. There are there are kind of ethics. There are kind of, there are, there are, when you're writing a country song, um, you know, if it's not for a song for you, a song you're imagining maybe for somebody else, you kind of think, who who are what, how, how does the guy want to be? We kind of know who right. are the people. What are the stories we we want to instill in this and the, the, the people we want to be on stage or see on stage? And you're right, it, there is there are those ideals and values in there. Yeah, yeah, it kind of breaks down into to two camps. It's like the stand up guy, or kind of like like uh, from the outlaw tradition, like the right. like the lovable creep. You know, <laughs> that's right. Right. The sh there's a sh when you those kind of shameless, yeah. reckless, rugged guys. There's something to that, too. That's a story yeah. that we like. That's a guy we like. Yeah. Right. Right. Um, uh, but often when those guys, when that archetype is pushed to it um, mm -hmm. in a song, um, often he does the right thing as well. At the very end, he pulls it out and does the yeah, right that's thing. That's right. That, 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 that's, yeah. There's got to be that redemptive there does. quality. There's got to be something redemptive in it, and I, and I think I, I personally, not every, that's not for everybody. I personally love that, and I think I think most people have that in their heart to kind of to kind of pull for that guy and hear that story. So you headed from Bethel Park, from Pittsburgh, straight to Nashville to go uh, at first to attend um, Belmont University. I, I don't think you made it all the way through. There's something that you and I have in common: college dropouts. Right? Look out, yeah, man. Well, I didn't go to Belmont, but I I definitely dropped out. Um, where, did you, where did you go? I went to Chapel Hill. Oh, great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. Uh, but, uh, but so that's a pretty serious move there, like to, to go to Nashville and to go to Belmont, presumably to, to study music. And like, so what, at what point did you realize that it was going to be something so serious that you were going to like pursue it? You were going to leave home. You're going to go halfway across the country. You were going to move to the place where people did this. Like, what did that thought process look like and what finally pushed you over the edge? Yeah. So I, it's kind of interesting. Um, I, you know, I, I started pick, you know, playing guitar, writing songs simultaneously when I was 14, I, I, I wasn't one of those guys that played covers for a long time and then started writing my own stuff. I mean, I started writing immediately, had an absolute passion for it, took it as far as I could in high school bands and stuff. And then I made a, um, I made a, like a, a solo singer songwriter, you know, CD my senior year with a, a guy that, you know, guys whose wife worked with my mom at the hospital and had re had a recording studio as a hobby, and we made this 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 tape, and um, I actually gave my CD to a guy um, that was coming through town. He was in a band, kind of in, in the scene, if you will, like if you remember that moment in time, kind of you know, in the dashboard confessional world a little bit, but way mm -hmm. smaller band. And uh, I just gave him my CD, which is actually the only time I've ever done that. Uh, and I gave him my solo stuff and he brought it back to, and he listened to it and gave it to the guy that was the head of his little indie label that he was on. And it was this indie label called 111 Records. And they had a kind of, you know, partnership with Warner Brothers. And so I was working at a dry cleaner and I got a phone call, um, from the guy, the head of the label. And I was 18 and he, he said, Hey, I, I heard your stuff. I really would like to fly you down to, and talk about giving you a record deal. And so I'm 18. I'm thinking, I mean, I, I knew I, around 17, 18, I knew I was, I wanted to be serious about pursuing it. Um, 
I didn't know what that looked like yet. I didn't know about, you know, much about Nashville or anything, but I knew I wanted to do it. And that, that whole, that thing kind of jump started the, uh, how serious I was going to be about it, I guess. So I, I ended up, it's, it's a long story. I don't know how much you want to get into it, but I, uh, I, I ended up turning down the deal. Um, but through that whole experience, I got partnered with this attorney. Well, pause um, there, but pause here because yeah. I, I am sure. interested in specifically that. Because I think when, you know, what's funny, I, I, I can't help but laugh because I think, I think of being an 18 year old, I think of being in that position and there had to be a significant part of you when you're working at the dry cleaner, you get that call. It's like, hey, I got a label in Nashville. I want to give you a deal. There has to be a significant part of you that is like, I'm fucking rich. Let's go back there for a minute. I, I don't mean to yeah. freeze over it. Cause that really was your question. Yeah. So no, and this was a late, this was a label in Orlando, Florida. Yeah. And um, the guy that owned the label was, the, was the, was in that band LFO. You remember new kids on the block had a bunch of hits. He was one yeah. of the guys in the band. And so that, you know, gave some amount of legitimacy, especially to a guy from Bethel park, Pennsylvania. And dude, I was thinking, I mean, this is it. I mean, I, I I thought, wow, this is easy. Right. Right. <laughs> I haven't even left town. All I've done is play the coffee shops around here. And I've got a guy offering me a record deal. And I absolutely imagine myself in a tour bus three mm -hmm. months later and on tour and living that life I saw on VH1. I, I, I thought all that was going to happen. Yeah. Um, so but, what, what gave you the... the um the the fortitude to turn something down like that like because that's a hard thing that's a hard thing to turn down at that age and in that position well so as i was saying i this this guy said brad the guy at the label said hey you know this is all looking great now i just need you to find an attorney and negotiate it i can hook you up with one of mine and i, and I didn't know anything but i was like well i know i should find my own attorney right, right. i don't have any rolodex other than you know, some of the bands we played with that toured through Pittsburgh. And I heard good things about this guy named Dan Friedman, that he was a super artist friendly kind of underdog attorney. So I called him up and um, he and he, you know, he's like, what do you got? I, you know, I got I got five minutes. What can I do for you? And I think that he just could sense my naivety, however you say that word. Yeah, uh, I think he liked me. He could tell I was lost. And he ended up taking about an hour to just talk to me and hear my story. And I told him about this record deal. And he said, hey, send it over to me. I'll take a look at it and see what I can do. So he, I just got a good feeling from the guy. And, and he marked up the contract. And I'll never forget being in my dad's basement, as I mentioned, where all the great music was playing. And he had a fax machine down there. And I remember sitting there watching the record deal come through the fax machine. And it was all marked up. I mean, he marked out whole paragraphs and added zeros to budgets in my favor and all that. I mean, and I was thinking, okay, yeah, this looks even better. <laughs> <laughs> so we send it over to the guy at the label and I, the, I got a call from a call back. It actually went straight to my voicemail. I think, I don't know. If, and, and I, and so I got this voicemail and he said, Hey, you know, he's like, I, I thought, I thought we had a relationship you know, you know, cause he had taken me and my dad down to Disney world and all this stuff, took us to the cheesecake factory, <laughs> talked about how rich we were going to be. And, uh, I thought we had a relationship and that, you know, I, I'm like, honestly, I'm really hurt by this. And, you know, we, we can't go forward like this. He's like, oh, if you want to talk about a record deal, you're gonna have to find a new attorney. But if you're going to work with this guy, the deal's off the table. And that was, I mean, that was the, the most uh, difficult position I've been in pr in my life, really, up to that point. I'm like, I'm 18. I have to choose to kind of trust one of these guys. I barely know both of them. And my, I feel like my dreams are kind of hanging in the balance of, it, you know, obviously they're not. Now that you get older, you see it doesn't all hang on that, but it, feel, it felt like it did. And, uh, but the, but the thing that Dan, Dan Friedman was the attorney and he said to me, he's like, Hey, He's like, listen, I, I think, I think you've got a lot of talent. He's like, frankly, I think you've got more talent than this label can really serve you. Um, and uh, he's like, you're young. He's like, and if you want to, if you want to get in the music business, it's this is a long road. And uh, he's like, and I'm willing to help you walk down the road. He's like, but I want you to know it's a long road. He said, and if I was you, I wouldn't get in bed with the first person that wants to sleep with you. 
And that was all of that <laughs> was, it was, it was a tough pill to swallow, but man, it just hit me like the truth. I just trusted that advice. And, um, and that's what I did. So, but as you can imagine, I, so I turned down the deal, but the, what, when my dreams felt a lot closer, you know, than, than they had before I got that phone call. Um, I, I guess, I guess the thing was, was heart wrenching for me and really tough, but at the same time, it really affirmed what I had inside. It affirmed this, this desire to do music for a living. I didn't, I didn't feel, you know, I, I guess I just felt like legitimized in a way. I said, well, somebody wanted to sign me. So if I can just keep going down this road and hopefully keep getting better, then maybe, you know, another door is going to open. And so I, I, but I, and my mom was relieved. She really wanted me to go to college. And her whole thing was, if you just go to college for two years, I, I'll support you in whatever you want to do. She's like, I just, she's like, I just don't want you to pass up that experience. I want you to know what a college experience is. And I think she was also thinking practically, hey, you know, if your music stuff fails, you can come back to this. And she's so practical. So and I, I went I wasn't thinking oh, I'm only going to go to school for two years. I really wasn't thinking that. But I, I thought if I'm going to go to school, I want to find a school that's, you know, close to music, a part of music. And I literally did a Google search, you know, and said, said you know, music colleges, music business colleges. And I, I, I sound Belmont University that way. And um, by the grace of God, got in. My grades were not good enough. I got I got turned away from other schools that were easier to get into, mm. but somehow I got into Belmont University. And um, and man, what a blessing that was! I, I can't even begin to tell you just the yeah. network and the culture it's, there. It yeah. seems like that initial path was a pretty star-crossed and auspicious path to be on. And let me just say, it is the most music business thing of all time for someone to basically say to you. I took you to Cheesecake Factory. That means I should probably get your publishing in perpetuity. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> not that that's oh what that guy God. said, but you get my point. Uh, but, it, you know, that's a very auspicious road that, that you walk there. What is, what is the Nashville that you would find on the ground when you arrived there at Belmont? And what was some of the extracurricular stuff that you were doing music-wise while you were taking classes? Yeah, so... The Nashville that I was excited to come to, in a lot of ways, was the one I found. And kind of going back to your country music thing, that actually it wasn't necessarily the country music scene that drew me to Nashville. Um, there was this really cool, and there still is, but particularly then, this really cool singer songwriter landscape. Um, guys like Dave Barnes and Matt Wirtz and Tyler James and Trent Dabbs, and um, there was there was just cool stuff happening here. Um, that I was discovering on MySpace before I got here. And, you know, because I got on MySpace to put my own music on there, and I kind of found all these, like, legit acts on there that I kind of found out most of them were independent artists, and there seemed to be a scene in Nashville. So I was really excited to get here and uh, meet some of those people and or just see them live for that, for that matter, not, meet, not even meet them yet. I thought they were way out of my league, but I was excited just to see them live. And uh, so when I hit the ground, man, uh, I immediately started to go find those shows that, you know, and a lot of them were being attended by like 10 people or 20 people. These people I was listening to on MySpace, you know, in my tech ed class in high school. I, I'm, and I didn't think anything of it. I was like, this is amazing. Mm -hmm. These guys are the best, you know? So that was kind of some of the extracurricular stuff I was doing. But on campus, I was... Um, you know, rubbing shoulders with amazing musicians that lived down the hall from me. Uh, and it, it was, I kind of was going through that humbling experience of, of seeing, you know, there's this little place called the Curb Cafe on campus where there was open mic nights and kind of watching the, the guys and girls that were like me coming from their hometowns. They were like the star in their town and they'd come in and, and just like, I mean, they were unbelievable. It was un unreal talent. So I was being humbled and simultaneously inspired and it kind of just lit a fire into my butt. I'm like, man, these people are so good. So I was going to a lot of shows and, you know, put a little band together and we, 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 you know, rehearse for little shows around town and eat Taco Bell after, I mean, I was writing songs and, you know, in my dorm, it was, it was a, I, I was writing like a fiend. I'll say that I was writing like a nut trying to, trying to keep up with the talent around me and, and again, I you know I was fresh off the experience of passing up that record deal, so I was really hungry to 
trying to make something else happen. Yeah, I think what's becoming clear now is that over the last 15 years, Nashville has been, it's always been a repository of talent, of course, but as a lot of talent has left cities like Los Angeles and New York, a lot of it has congregated around Nashville. And in the last 15 years, particularly in the music business, not just in country, but every kind of iteration of the music business, there's been like, um, you know, Nashville has been like a real lodestar for incredibly talented people. And it's um, every yeah. time I go there, I'm, I, I kind of have the same feeling of you're in awe and you're also like, man, I got to get my... I really got to get my ass in gear if I want to keep up with, with these folks. Yeah. Yeah. I, f- I feel that. I, mean, I feel that every day, you know, every week I, I feel that still, but you know, obviously when you first get here, I think it hits you the hardest because you're just seeing it for the first time, and, but it is. And, and, and yeah, so there, there was an amazing, you know, singer songwriter world, I guess that I was really into and the country was kind of still in the background at that point for me. So who were, um, who was, one of the first writers to kind of take you under their wing and, you know, someone who's already kind of established and maybe a professional at it, like who took you under their wing yeah. and kind of showed you the ropes? Man, there was really quite a few, um, quite a few. And I think that's part of the beautiful thing about Nashville is that the kind of welcoming arms, right. Of, of the town. And, um, one of the first ones that comes to mind is, uh, Connie Harrington. Uh, I don't know if she, she wrote, you know, I, I drive your truck, a uh, big Rodney Atkins song. And, um, but even, you know, she wrote with me for, um, uh, sorry, the Lee Brothers, the Lee Bryce song. Um, she wrote with me for my early records that were really still pop rock stuff and, mm. and really dug, you know, dug into that and enjoyed it. Even though she was writing, you know, big country hits, you know, uh, on the next day, she, she really, recognized you know my talent and, and and really encouraged me and i learned a ton and she d- digs in the songs i mean we'd, we'd get together at 10 and there'd be times i wouldn't leave till six what? um wow. yeah we just yeah and, and it, yeah i i don't know if i i have that endurance anymore uh I, if i could do it anymore especially now having two kids but she that's how she wrote man so i think from her I really, I, I really saw again going, but talking about the craft, yeah. kind of digging in and waiting, 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 digging, refining. Um, so she, she, she really early on was one of the more, more successful people to, to spend a lot of time writing with me. But the list goes on. You know, Luke Laird is another one who I'm in business with now, and um, it, yeah, there's, there's, there's been so many. Yeah. Let me dig in there for a second. You mentioned you learned so much from from Connie Harrington, and you'd have like these uh, these longer uh, writing sessions. I'm wondering what exactly it is that you were learning about about refining the song, and also I'd like to dig in. What do you mean when you said you had to learn to just be waiting, waiting, waiting? Mm-hmm. Like what what does that look like in a in a write yeah. for you? Yeah. Um. So I guess we'll start with the waiting part. You know, I, I think. I think, you know, that, that, that idea of kind of looking at songwriting a little more, and I, and I didn't grow up, I'm not a hunter. Uh, I, don't, I only, you know, fish every once in a while, but kind of looking at it like a hunt, almost hunting a little bit, you know, I, like you're sitting, you're in a tree stand and you're waiting for something to come by that, and, and not just expecting to walk into the woods and there'd be a giant deer right there when you have your gun up, right? It's that idea of, if we are, are patient and we just talk a little bit and we think a little bit and we ask each other some questions and we ponder and just kind of strum our, you know, maybe, you know, we're going to get inspired and something's going to come in here. We're going to have a moment of breakthrough. And when I think about writing with Connie, honestly, a lot of the time, I, that's what I remember. I remember those waiting periods, but I look back on and listen back to a lot of the songs we wrote and they were really good. And they, a lot of them didn't come easy. Um, so of course there's something to, you know, I know you're a songwriter too. It's like, there's definitely something to just like coming in and there's an energy and you get on it and great songs happen that way too. And of course we all wish it happened that way all the time, but from Connie and people like her, I learned that process of waiting uh, can be very rewarding as well. It's, it's a very uncomfortable or it can be a very uncomfortable space though. I, yes. I've, 
recently, one of the most fruitful ways I've found is I'll just, I have a small, you know, project studio at my place. So I'll just go and I'll, I'll open up, you know, I'll open up the mic and I'll just sit in front of the mic with the headphones on and I'll just sit there and I'll try to bang something out um, and kind of wait for it in, in the way that you describe. And yeah. I'll be there for a couple hours. And the thing is, it's very fruitful and it really brings forward um, some the best stuff. Do you find, though, I yeah. find when I'm in that position, for some reason, it's very uncomfortable to be. I want to pull out my phone. Oh, yeah. I want to go, oh. you know, my wife has asked me to do laundry for the last two weeks, which I haven't done. But now all of a sudden I want to go do the laundry instead yeah. of <laughs> sitting there. You know what I mean? Like, I, I don't know what it is, but it, I, I get very antsy when I'm in that um, uh, that waiting mode that you described. Oh, I do, too. I mean, there, there, there is so much resistance. I mean, I, I think there is so much resistance toward creativity. And, uh, yeah, I, I feel the same way. If I, if I was doing it at my house. I, 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 I've never been able to successfully do that as an adult in my own home. I mean, I could do it when yeah. I was in college in a dorm where I had no responsibilities or, you know, and nothing else to do or anything. Uh, or when I was in high school, I could do it because actually that writing was putting off what I needed to be doing, which was my homework or cleaning my room. Right. But now being an adult, uh, you know, there's so, and especially with social media, our attention spans are, are compromised. And there's so much at our fingertips. It's incredibly hard to do. So yes, it's, it is not easy, but again, that's what I, that's what I, when you're sitting with Connie, somehow that you just kind of like, this is what we're, she's the boss. This is what we're doing. We're sitting yes. here. We're waiting, you know, having her to kind of mentor and, and, and show me that and lead that um, was, was huge. It gets harder and harder though, as you, you know, if you're married, you have kids, you know, I have kids as well. And my wife mm -hmm. is super supportive, but it's so much easier to tell her at the end of a day, if she asked me, what did you do today? And I didn't write it all, but I had stuff like, well, I had a, you know, I had a phone meeting with such and such, and I had to order some more merchandise for this. And I, I got a tour right. routed. She'll listen to that. And she'll be like, that's great. But if I did the thing that I'm supposed to be doing, which is writing, because that's where all the value comes from in the end. It, it, it feels ter terrible to just tell her like, well, I sat in a chair for five hours and uh, nothing happened. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. You know? oh, yeah, it's, it's not it's not satisfying uh, until something does happen. And, and, and yeah. you, but you don't have that guarantee. And that's what's so tough about it. It's so much more appealing to go to the guarantee, the things you can do. I can go to UPS. Yes. I can fold these clothes. I can send an email to that guy about setting up a meeting. Yeah. And, I, and you, you, like you're saying, you get that concrete, uh, you know, um, what's the word I'm looking for? You know what I mean? Yeah, Satisfaction. Accomplishment. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it, but it, the reverse side of that is, again, like all the only reason that the music business exists and that there's all this stuff that goes along with it is because, you know, you can't have a career without without a number of songs that people have to have to listen to, have to sing out loud, have to have tattooed right. on their arm, have to, you know, show their kids. Like that is where the ultimate store of value ultimately is. Yeah. Agreed. 100%. So, so um, who else were you working with at that? You mentioned Connie Harrington. You mentioned working with Luke Laird. I'm a huge fan of, of his. What were some of the techniques that you were learning uh, working with him on different songs? So, you know, Luke is, I learned, I continue to learn so much from Luke. I, I, I learn a lot about just, I mean, how, how he is in a writing room. I think like his demeanor, his energy is so humble. And like, I think in, in a very different way, you know, writing with Connie, I wouldn't say it's fun, but there's a lot of value in that. Writing with Luke is really fun in that his energy, and you can hear it in the music. It's like, he's trying to make you feel comfortable and, and build you up and encourage you. And so if you're, if you're whatever, if you're kind of singing a little thing and he's like, what's that? What was that? That's cool. And then he'll take it and he'll put his headphones on and he'll plug it in and make it something even more than that. But kind of, I, I think he's really great and he's jokes around a lot. I think he kind of, I, I think one of his biggest strengths besides just being an amazing writer and producer with great work ethic is that he, he kind of, I think, helps people let their guard down and have fun and enjoy the creative process. I think that's part of his magic. Um, it's kind of 
helping people release their inhibitions and kind of, I think he approaches music a lot like a fan and not as much like a, a critic or a, you know, a maker, but like a fan. So it, when I, I felt when I, when I feel like when I've been able to write with Luke, it's like, I always, I always feel like he's a fan of me, of music, of what I'm doing, what's coming out. And I think that's one of his biggest gifts. And, uh, so I, I, I've, I've, I've tried to do that as well when I'm writing with people, um, just kind of call out the greatness I, I see in them and here and, you know, crack jokes and try to make it fun. And you write something we want to listen to, you know, there's a lot of value in that too. You know, that there's, there's so many ways to approach it. Right. I mean, I don't, and I'm not putting Connie down at all. Like I said, there's a lot of value in that kind of more contemplative city waiting thing, but um, just kind of depends on the day and the idea and what you're chasing and uh, what you're trying to make too. But that's something I've learned from Luke. Are you stuck in a rut? Are you tired of listening to that Jimmy Buffett 20th Century Masters CD over and over again and need some new music? Are you sick of making hamburger helper beef stroganoff for dinner every night and you want something new to cook? What you are looking for, my friends, is the Enthusiast Digest. That's my monthly newsletter, which arrives in your inbox the first Sunday morning of every month, bursting with musical recommendations, poetry selections, recipes and cooking techniques for my favorite dishes, and items of general interest culled from the vast cesspool that is the Internet. The Enthusiast Digest is free to subscribe to. If you dig the poetry that you hear on this show and the artists that you're hearing from, you'll dig the newsletter because I approach it with the exact same sensibility of curation. Go to joepugmusic.com slash newsletter today to sign up for free. That is joepugmusic.com slash newsletter. It takes approximately 15 seconds to sign up for a free newsletter that will enrich the first Sunday of your month with a veritable cornucopia of new and delightful recommendations. That's the Enthusiast Digest, the first Sunday of every month. Sign up for free at joepugmusic.com slash newsletter. Steve manages to bring a human and emotional touch to the modern commercial Nashville format. I appreciate that about him. And it's a delicate balance that reminds me of this poem by Charles Bukowski entitled, The Bluebird. There's a bluebird in my heart that wants to get out, but I'm too tough for him. I say, stay in there. I'm not going to let anybody see you. There's a bluebird in my heart that wants to get out, but I pour whiskey on him and inhale cigarette smoke, and the whores and the bartenders and the grocery clerks never know that he's in there. There's a bluebird in my heart that wants to get out, but I'm too tough for him. I say, stay down. Do you want to mess me up? You want to screw up the works? You want to blow my book sales in Europe? There's a bluebird in my heart that wants to get out, but I'm too clever. I only let him out at night sometimes when everybody's asleep. I say, I know that you're there, so don't be sad. Then I put him back, but he's singing a little in there. I haven't quite let him die, and we sleep together like that, with our secret pact, and it's nice enough to make a man weep. But I don't weep. Do you? It seems to me, from the outside looking in, your first real breakthrough was was co-writing Dirk Bentley's song "Riser." Was that your first kind of breakthrough, first piece of of uh, significant success in Nashville? Yeah, I would I would say that it is. I mean, as far as you know, success is a funny thing in Nashville. I feel like it's 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 and it's something I struggle with because I I feel like Nashville kind of has its own definition of success you know and if it hits the scale in nashville then it's success so i had think you know for me where i was coming from there were things i was really excited about like little placements and tv shows and 
you know, things like that. But yes, I mean, to answer your question, the first like mainstream, something that people could look at your Wikipedia and say, yeah, I know what that is. Yeah. It was yeah. definitely, it was definitely rises. Uh, what did that, what did that whole process feel like? What did it feel like uh, when that song got cut? What did it feel like when that song, you know, became what it is? Like, describe to me less the creative part of it and more just the personal part of seeing it take off. And it's 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 hard to remember. Uh, let me see. I remember. Um, well, first of all, it was it was incredibly. I almost didn't believe it. You know, when Dirk Bentley was like, "Yeah, we want to. We love this song. We we absolutely love it." We're going to record it. We're going to name the album after it. Right. I was like, I was right. like what? I, I, I just, I didn't really believe it. Right. I, I was. Um, and I think for me, uh, you know, kind of going back to that record deal story when I was younger, you know, and I kind of had, I had a bunch of almost record, you know, showcases for labels that you know, didn't work out. I had so many things that kind of didn't pan out that I was almost like, I'll believe it when I see it, you know? Yeah. And, and, and I, I kind of I still had this like this defense mechanism up a little bit. And, uh, but I remember I, I, my wife and I had just gotten married. I mean, it was a couple months into our marriage and we woke up and we were sitting, we were in, we were still in our bed and we, and I pulled up my laptop and I got this email that was sent out like from by Capitol records. You know, I get, I get those all the time. But for other artists, like I don't care, whatever. And this was like Dirk Bentley releases out right a new album Riser. And I opened the email and had this incredible video. Like it was so inspiring. And it was all, and they had this cool logo that was like the, you know, the the rising phoenix was kind of his whole brand on that album. It was kind of based on that song. And and I I I had goosebumps on my whole body. And I, I just, we watched the whole thing. I'm like, Dirk Bentley's riser, you know? And it, it was just like, that was when I was like, okay, this is real. <laughs> they're not gonna, I don't think you're going to pull this video down. I think we're really doing it. So it was, it was incredibly surreal and, and, and so encouraging. And, uh, you know, the journey of that, I had never had a song that was, you know, on a major label artist and, and, you know, it ended up going on the radio later in the album cycle. And, you know, I didn't, I didn't know, I didn't have anything to compare it to, which is kind of beautiful. I'm, I'm thankful for that. Uh, and I didn't even have a lot of friends even that had done that. You know, I, the, my peers at that time really weren't even getting cuts. Mm -hmm. um, it was kind of more to the people I was looking up to getting cuts. So it was kind of this fun ride to be on. And, and uh, we, I went to see him play twice on that tour once in LA and once in, in around Birmingham and bought the t-shirt man that had riser on it. I still have it. Uh, and, and I remember too being backstage cause he kind of gave some of the people on the album, you know, whatever backstage passes to, to the show in Alabama. So Gracie and I, my wife went down and I snuck backstage to grab a beer before his set. I was, I was kind of back there then went out and came back. And he's, and it happened to be the moment that he had his whole band circling up, you know, doing a pre-show huddle. Yeah. And I was like, oh man, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. And he pulled me and my wife into the huddle and was like, man, guys, this is Steve Mokley. He wrote Riser, the song. And, and, you know, and just, dude, it was, he, he's the cool, he's the coolest guy, man. So that moment and getting to see him play it live and the stuff that it's done with St. Jude, you know, they've kind of played it during that radio fawn and raising a lot of money for, you know, childhood cancer. And it's just been very surreal, man. I, it's, uh, I'm very grateful for that song. You know, all the success of that song though would put you at a crossroads there because, you know, you could have at that point just really pursued the, the life of, songwriter. I'm a songwriter. That's my main thing. Instead, you very much continued to lean into your artist career. And that's what's been bearing the most fruit um, of, of late. Can you describe uh, making that decision? Because a decision like that, for people who aren't in the business, that's very much a decision of kind of like betting on yourself. It's not exactly the most expedient thing to do, uh, banking on the artist yeah. career. So can you talk can you speak a little bit to the crossroads that that song would put you at and, and how you decided to, to kind of bet on yourself and, and to continue to move forward most seriously with you, with your artist career? Yeah. 
Yeah, well, I mean, you're exactly right. I mean, that, and that, that, is, the, that is the kind of question that, I mean, I, it, it, I've lost so much sleep over that question, Joe. I can't even begin to tell you. Yeah. Uh, uh, <clears throat> but in, and, I, and, I've, and I've gone back and forth on that, truthfully. Um, uh, but at that time, you know, it, it, it was this, it was a really exciting thing. And, I, and I, it kind of did, it kind of made everything a little more serious, right? It, it kind of went from being an independent artist and who no one really knew in town to like, well, now people kind of know who I am and there's these opportunities. And, and, and at the onset, um, I mean, it, this is not a simple answer. Uh, at the onset, um, it did bring about interest from major labels as an artist. And I wasn't interested. Um, Even though they were going to take you to Cheesecake Factory? <laughs> I, I, I might even got a nicer meal in Cheesecake Factory. They're going to take you to Ruth's Chris. All right, fair I, enough. I was so, at that point, I was so, I was kind of like, man, I don't, initially I was like, I really just want to write and I want to, I want to, I want to make records, but I want, I don't want to, I was, I didn't want to sacrifice, um, man, I, I guess the, the freedom I had. And I was, I was scared of kind of the, the big machine of Nashville. I was scared of success in mm -hmm. a lot of ways. Um, what that was going to do to my life that I was enjoying quite a bit and am enjoying still. Um, so I, I wrestled with it, man. And then, you know, I wrestled with it for a little while. And then I got to a point where I started working with creative nation. Um, I, I left the guy, I, I had a, my whole career was just me and my buddy, Tim. And, and, and we ended up having to part ways and, I got a new deal and a new team around me at Creative Nation a couple, a couple years after Riser, and um, I, I Beth Laird, who Luke's Luke's wife, is the head of Creative Nation. And she said, "Hey, you know, we we think you got you know a lot of talent. We want to we want to we want to help you get where you're trying to go." And she said, "But before we do anything, we got to know where you want to go." And uh, I honestly was like, "I don't know." You know, but she kind of mapped it out. She said, we can go this way, kind of be the independent artist guy, or or you can be just a songwriter guy, or you can be a, you know, a, a bigger country star, you know? And man, I had lost so much sleep over, should I do that mm -hmm. uh, and really go for it? And I, uh, it was something I, I, you know, lost a lot of sleep over, prayed over. I eventually said, you know what? I'm freaking, I want to go for it. Like, I, yeah. I got to just know. I got to know I tried. So that's kind of how we started to position things and built a team around that, that goal. And, and, uh, that, that kind of was the first kind of, I guess I started to have success as an artist with a song called suitcase that, that became, that was a hit on XM radio. And, um, and we ended up getting a radio team to go to FM radio. It did not, it didn't pan out. I, but I, I honestly, man, I, in a lot of ways, it was me kind of facing a lot of my fears, getting out there and doing it and seeing what this whole thing was, seeing what it was about. And, uh, but there was, there was some success there. I mean, uh, like I, I got to play the Grand Ole Opry and I got to go on tour with legends like Willie Nelson and open for Tim and Faith. So I did get to have all these really cool firsts, mm -hmm. um, playing an arena in my hometown and these things I kind of always dreamed of. But, um, Ultimately, the song failed at FM radio, and he kind of had to say, hey, are we going to try to do this again? You know, are we going to keep going and keep going at that? And, and that was around the time I had, a, I had my, uh, my wife and I had our first kid, and uh, it just it was another big change, you know, and, and I, I had some perspective now. I kind of saw what that looked like and um, decided that I didn't want to do it again. Uh, I didn't really want to go at bat in that way. I, but I, but I kind of had a new gratitude for again the free. I, I love making music. I love making records, and I love my audience. And I and you know we've had really unique ways of of, of serving that audience and connecting with those people. Um, so I leaned in harder to that, and also leaned into to songwriting. So I to so to answer your question, man, I I'm, I am very I very much feel like a hybrid. I, I haven't. There are times I wish I could just say, I'm just an artist, I'm going to, or I'm just a songwriter. And I, and I, I have that inner turmoil, you can probably sense. But really, I think I know that I, lo I love doing both. I feel the most alive and fulfilled when I'm kind of doing both of those things. And so 
um, that's kind of where I'm at. I've never been able to let either one of them go. Yeah, outside looking in, I, I mean, it seems to me that you're you're you really carving a pretty unique and pretty desirable path between those two things. And it's nice, it's nice that before you had kids, that you got to take that one, like screw it, man. I think the pitcher's about to throw me a fastball, and I'm just going to take a huge cut at this right now. You know what yeah. I mean? It just oh my gosh, yeah. Like because it's. Because the thing is, if that does take off at FM radio and then you have your first kid, I mean, obviously it'd be great. You'd have, you know, in, in one sense, it'd be a ton of money, this, that, and the other. But there's also an insane amount of um, responsibility with that. We just talked to um, on the podcast that fella Ash Bowers, and he talks mm -hmm. about, you know, him making the decision to just be like, man, like I see what guys and gals at that level have to do the responsibilities that they have. And, you know, it doesn't always, it can be at real odds with having a young family. It just can't. Yeah, it, it can. You know, and, and, and that, that's a hundred percent, man. It's, it's a difficult life. I think, you know, that's something that, you know, you don't know until you, until you kind of get to see it. It looks so incredible. And, uh, in, and, and there are so many incredible things about it. And I think some people are really born to do it Yes, and they have that insane drive. So it, but yes. I think it's, it's it's kind of level. It's kind of this deal with leveling with yourself. And for me, you know, I, I think being being young, everyone's like, you, you know, you could do this and you should be this and you can. Um, but kind of go, what do I really want? You know, at the end of the day, what do I feel like I'm made to do? What makes me come the most alive on all facets of life? You know, and that's really what I've been in pursuing in pursuit of. Because I think that's ultimately where I'm gonna I'm gonna make the biggest impact and 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 do my best work too. So, uh, but you're right. I'm, I'm glad I, I'm so glad that I, I faced what I felt like in my mind was honestly the dragon and, and, and got to take a couple swings and see what that life looks like. You know, even though I only tasted a fraction of that success, I got to be in the green rooms and on the tour buses and brushing shoulders of people that were really doing it on a big level. Yes. You kind of go, what, what is that? Now I kind of know what that is. And, and, and for me personally, it just, it lost a little bit of its appeal for me. I, yeah. I know exactly what you mean. And, and in some ways, like getting to just take the smallest taste of that, you know, having, it's like, yeah, I got the opener's green room, but I'm still, you know, I'm still in the building and my name is still, you know, in a small font yeah. on the marquee there. Like it, in my mind, it's almost like the best of both worlds. Cause you get that taste and you see what it is, but you also, um, you you were also able to avoid being consumed by it, be, being eaten by the dragon. You, you get to go inside yeah. the dragon's lair, see all the treasure in the dragon's lair, and then you know just kind of sneak home to your wife before you get burnt to a crisp. Uh, <laughs> honestly, that that is truly how it feels a lot of ways. But being out there, what I realized is all of a sudden, when I, I I've I've always been really grateful and really in a lot of ways really content, you know, with with my career and with my life. And all of a sudden, when I was out there in a sprinter van, slugging it out and seeing all these, like, oh, they've got, you're right, come to a festival, they've got one tour bus. Oh, they've got two tour buses. Yeah. Oh, they've got one. And there's all these metrics all of a sudden where yeah. I talked about that scale, right? I mm -hmm. felt like I, I, I was put on a scale and, I, and I'm, I'm, I'm 0.01 ounces, right? I feel, and I felt so... Um, I felt like I wanted all these things all of a sudden that I didn't want when I wasn't looking at them, if that makes sense. So I'm like, was that in my heart or was this what, in front, what was in front of me? And uh, it took a little bit of space stepping back to kind of go, you know, that, that was just my, you know, that was just what I was around. I suddenly, I, I could see how easy for me, I don't want to speak for everybody, but for me, it was, it became very, very appealing yeah. And very, I could kind of get drunk on the whole idea just by, it was hard to be close to and not, you know, completely yeah. just want it all, but you know, kind of the, the musical equivalent of the Dave Ramsey saying, we buy things we don't need with money. We don't have to impress people we don't like. And exactly, you, you know, so that's, but we all fall into it here and there, whether it's with music Absolutely. or money or, or whatever and I else. I still do. I still yeah. do. You know, but. But yeah, but having a little bit of space has been has been really healthy for me and giving me some real perspective. Well, we're glad that you got that perspective. Glad that you're walking this this road. Like I said, I think it's I think you're really carving out a pretty unique 
kind of center road down the middle, which is is very desirable. And uh, yeah, Thank man, you. I really appreciate you uh, coming on the show. It was an absolute pleasure talking to you. It was great talking to you too, Joe. Thanks for the great questions, man, and for for you know taking time to talk to you. Yeah, brother. Okay, I'll see you down the road, man. Yeah, sounds great. Peace. God bless. This week's show is brought to you by Banzoogle. Built by musicians and for musicians, Banzoogle is an all-in-one platform to build a beautiful website for your music. Use promo code TWS, the initials of our podcast, TWS, to get 15% off the first year of any subscription. Steve Mokler's latest album is entitled Make a Little Room, available everywhere music is sold or streamed. If before we meet again you sit down to write, please remember... An expensive drug habit is not a song. A compelling Instagram account is not a song. And most importantly, reverb is not a song. So let all that take care of itself. And for you, just keep your eye on the song.